It is a to you. Stop. You never stop. Oh, even when I don't see it, you. 
His name is above, his name is above depression. His name is above loneliness. Oh, his name is above disease. His name is above cancer. His name is above every other name. Hi, friends. We are so glad that you have joined us uh, to worship God. We're going to spend some time just lifting our voices in song together, uh, giving God praise in that way. So we invite you, wherever you happen to find yourself, uh, to sit, stand, whatever makes you comfortable in the space that you're in, as you just join us in lifting some songs of praise to God. Let's sing. Your love's making all things new. You're working in all for good. For the things of this world, there is hope renewed in the life that is found in you. Today and forever, your love never changing, his hope never fading. Hallelujah. My faith is in things unseen, bringing life where it has not been, speaking things that are not.
Hey friends, welcome to FCC. We are so glad that you've joined us as we sing together, as we study the Bible together. Tommy, our Afton campus pastor, is going to be taking us just a little bit further through our Ephesians series this morning. And you know, it's fantastic that we can do church together like this online. But the truth is, we miss you guys. We miss seeing your faces. We miss seeing you all together in one room with us. And you know, we have hope that things are going to get back to normal soon and we'll be reunited together. And this little hope reminds us of the big hope that we have in God, that we will be united with God for eternity. So let's take just a little bit more time. Let's praise God for this truth and this hope that we have because of Jesus. So we pour out 
Friends, during these uncertain times, we take hope in the knowledge that God is still in control. We are thankful that he will never leave us or forsake us as his own. So, as we continue to worship, lift up these words to him.
so thankful. We're so thankful that even in the middle of all of the chaos going on around us and all of the noise that surrounds us, we're still able to come together virtually and meet to worship you. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, First Christian Church. I'm Chris with the C, and it's time to tune in to this week's FCC Pulse. Regeneration Large Group live stream is going public. Join us at fccgreen.org slash regenlive or on Facebook Monday, April 27th at 6.30 p.m. for our monthly Q&A with Regen staff and coaches. You can ask your questions in the live stream chat or get them to us ahead of time by emailing us at regen at fccgreenville.org. A Zoom discussion meeting will begin at 7.30 p.m. after the large group live stream ends. The discussion meeting is open to anyone interested in joining Regeneration for the first time and to current and or past participants and mentors. If you are interested in joining the Zoom meeting, make sure you email us at regen at fccgreenville.org to receive the meeting link and the password. We had a great time hosting another Scott and Staff Live this past Tuesday as we talked about our 180 student ministry with student minister Wes Ford and resident Gabe Fuller. Want to know one of the best parts for us? Getting to interact with you. Your interaction helps set the agenda. So join us on Facebook Live at 7 p.m. on Thursdays only, moving forward. Find us on Facebook at FCC Green. All right, friends, we've been hard at work to keep you informed and to make connection with you as easy and effective as possible. Part of the hard work has been going towards something new and creative that we are super excited about. And today we wanted to go ahead and tease you with what that's gonna be. That's right, we are working with Subsplash to redesign our website and bring back a new and improved FCC app. It's all still in the works and not quite finished yet, but we wanted to go ahead and give you a heads up so you're ready when it hits the app store. Keep your eyes peeled for updates. We hope you are as excited as we are. Well, that's going to wrap up this week's FCC Pulse. Thanks for tuning in. FCC, so glad that you are with us right now. If you are new to First Christian Church, I'm one of the campus pastors here. I'd love to tell you just a little bit about us. One sentence. This church is awesome. Seriously, I'm so thankful to be a part of this church community. Over these few weeks, you all have been so encouraging to us as we've been working hard to make our services happen online. I've loved all of your notes of encouragement on social media, and so many of you have been including little notes of encouragement dropped into your Connect cards as you've been filling that out, and even on the online chat. You all are amazing people. Thank you. Thank you for your words of support. Thank you for your continued financial stewardship as you are pursuing generosity with us in your giving. Thank you for your faithfulness to the mission of God in our community. Okay, go ahead and grab your Bible. 
We're going to be landing in Ephesians chapter 4 as we continue our series through the book of Ephesians and speaking of you, our incredible community. We're going to get to hear from you as you read this text for us. This was one of the highlights of our time together last week, and so many of you had said that you loved the shared reading of the Word, and so we're going to do that again as we turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 through 24. Let's read together. Ephesians four seventeen through 24. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned of Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. Friends, let's pray together. God, would you transform us as we hear your word? Would you use this time together to work in our lives and shape us for the sake of your glory, we pray. Amen. So I want to start with a question for you. Just what have you been doing during your COVID time? If I'm judging by the Lowe's parking lot as I drive past Many of you have been spending the time sprucing up your homes or working on your yards. But what about maybe some of you have been doing spring cleaning, finally going through some of those totes that are in the basement that you've been putting off and putting off. Maybe you've been doing some reading. If you're like me, there's this list of books that I just want to read and it's overwhelming. So maybe you've been making a dent in that list during this time. Or maybe you've been baking. Listen, if you need a volunteer to test your sourdough bread recipe, or maybe you want to know which cinnamon roll recipe is better, I will carry that burden for you. We could arrange some kind of no contact drop off here at the church building. You just bring it over and I will carry that burden for you. Just a walk through my neighborhood. And I know that some people have been spending their time grilling, working on their recipes for their smoker. Once again, no contact drop off. For that matter, if it's really good brisket or maybe some ribs, I'll come pick it up from you. Kidding, of course. I've been doing a little too much eating during this time. Anyone else there with me? Well, maybe it's not eating for you, but maybe you've been spending some time doing some crafts or working on a jigsaw puzzle or spending your time in in a way where you've been trying to do some stuff together that's different. Well, there's one thing that I've left to the very end, and the reason is I think across the board, This one thing is probably what many of us have been spending a lot of our time doing, and that's media consumption. Internet and television stats show that there is a large spike in the worldwide consumption of media, whether that's social media usage, whether that's just television watching or Netflix or Disney Plus or video games. Everyone seems to be filling their time with an increase of something. Because if you think about all of the things that have been canceled, sports teams that would have had practice every single day, travel plans that maybe were for business or for the sports tournaments or even just for vacation, all of those are now canceled. Community theater dance classes, exercise groups, all canceled. 
Thrift stores are closed. Yard sales aren't happening. Family reunions are canceled. Graduations, birthday parties, even weddings and funerals. The truth is, I could go on and on, and I know that 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 starts to get heavy. It maybe reminds you of something that's very personal. And as we experience this time together, what we are finding is that this creates a deep void in our lives, and we're filling it with things, and we're filling it with activities. Now listen, I know that you're baking because there's no flour and yeast at the grocery store. So I know you're filling this with something. The truth is, this is not just filling with an activity. A lot of us are experiencing this emotional, heavy loss that for some of us, the baking that we're doing is not just filling our time, but filling our stomachs. Reality is, we're using the food as an an emotional thing for us, a coping mechanism. It's like the emotional eating is on the rise and so is day drinking. I had a conversation just this week about the difficulty of these moments, about the stress and the sadness and how it's created an increase in drinking. Maybe you've seen some old habits come to life again during this time, and whether you've turned to food for comfort, or alcohol as an escape, or self-harm just to feel something again, when we experience a loss like this, it shakes us, and it rattles the sense of peace and comfort that we've had. Another conversation I had just this week was, with a friend who told me, he said, I never realized how much I depended on my income and my investment account for a sense of safety and security. Friends, the heavy truth of COVID is that you may be discovering some things about yourself and some sinful patterns that are tough to see. That's why I'm so glad that we get to look at Scripture together. Because when we see these old patterns of sin emerge, even some sinful habits that you thought were dead, this passage in Ephesians contains truth that we desperately need. So let's look together in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. Now, this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Here's the deal. You could just take a marker and you could cross out the word Gentile and replace it with American. More specifically, you could just write in your own name. God's word is amazing in a way that what God knew was that you would be looking at this passage today and he knew that we would need these words for us. It's as if they were written just yesterday. Here's how I know that this is about us, about Christians. In the letter to the Ephesians, the author Paul is writing to Christians who used to be Gentiles. They were non-Jews. They were people who did not grow up learning the scriptures, and they may have been involved in some form of pagan worship, but their history is not as a follower of God. So the sense that we should take here, unlike other places in this letter where Jew and Gentile are referenced, This is less like a cultural category or a nation category. Instead, think about the life of people before the renewing work that Christ brings. The life of a person before Jesus brought renewal. That's what we see here. A good reminder of how we might know this would be to look back into the second chapter of Ephesians 2 in verse 3, and we would see, among whom we all once lived 
in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind. And we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. All of us were once in this category. That's why we know this isn't just a cultural reference but a spiritual one to the condition that we all experienced before the regenerating work of Jesus Christ. So as we're reading, it says, you must no longer walk. Don't live this way. Don't walk in futility. The mind of a Gentile is the old way of living. It's empty. It's without real meaning. Their minds are darkened and not capable of producing any kind of useful result. It's futile. And so in verse 18, we continue where it says, They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. This is a spiritual ignorance That is, because of their separation from God. You see that word alienated, and it's a reminder of where we've been in chapter 2 previously as we've been working our way through Ephesians. In chapter 2, verse 12, it says for us to remember at one time, we, we were separated, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers, strangers of the covenant of promise. It says that we had no hope without God in the world. The reason we had no hope is because being alienated from God means being separated from Christ. And that's why we see in chapter 4 here. This is what Paul says when he says, here's why you are alienated. Look at this again in verse 18. There at the end, it says that they were alienated. They were separated. Why? Because of the hardness of heart. Let's continue reading in verse 19. It says, They have become callous, giving themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. The word picture that Paul is shaping for us is the picture of a heart that is hardened and callous. It's helpful because we know that a callous is not something that you develop easily. Uh, For example, when you pick up a guitar and you're learning how to play the guitar, you develop a callus on your fingers only after experiencing crazy pain in the tips of your fingers. Like, here's how that works. You play until it hurts over and over and over again until eventually it doesn't hurt. This is the process of the human heart in regards to sin. We know what starts out as just a small rebellion, almost an innocent sin, just barely rubbing against our heart. As this sin is repeated, it rubs ever so slightly against our heart until that sin no longer begins to hurt. We are dull to the feeling And we no longer have a sense of remorse or conviction because hardened hearts lead to a deadening of the senses. And then, because the senses are dull and dead, a drive to feel something for sensation leads to sensuality. As they gave themselves to sensuality, which is really just an unrestrained of behavior. And it talks about sensuality really being as a sexual behavior. These, the, 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 the idea here is that there's this continual lust for more, this broad sense that they have abandoned themselves to give in to gratifying themselves. If a desire's felt, the greed says yes, and thirst for more. I can't help thinking right now about the truth of this scripture for some of us right now. Because there are lust-filled battles 
that are being waged in the hearts of people worldwide right now. As people long for a sense of feeling in the midst of isolation, this lustful drive results in countless people giving themselves over to pornography use. And I pray with Paul and I say, we must no longer live this way. Feeding our sinful desires does not result in fulfillment. Pleasures fully indulged cease to please. In fact, the opposite happens. Instead of fulfillment and satisfaction, we find emptiness. We feed an appetite, it only grows. Friends, we need to hear these words. We need to sense the strength that they bring. A continual lust for more, a greedy practice for impurity. This does not satisfy. In John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus reminds us and teaches, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me should never thirst. We understand what this is saying as Jesus teaches about what really fills us. We understand intellectually. We understand theologically. We know the truth of these words. So then why does Paul speak so graphically and give his command so strongly? Because we don't need to pass this over lightly. Paul's intent is to make us face the reality of our experience that when we harden our hearts to the truth of these words, we need to remember that this is written to believers. He gives these warnings to Christians. Why do Christians need this kind of warning? Because friends, I've been talking to so many of you, and, and I know that you are struggling with sin right now. This kind of sin that feels innocent at first. A sin that is seemingly private or harmless. The sin that we indulge for just a little while begins to harden our hearts and darken our minds to the evil of what we're doing. And it ultimately makes us less sensitive less fulfilled by the profound satisfaction that God provides by his blessing in our lives. Let's keep reading in chapter 4. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. I love how verse 20 just leaps off the page at us. It's in clear contrast. It's like a hard turn in the passage. And this contrast helps us to see so clearly that the old way of life is sharply different from the new way that we have learned. Paul says, you were taught differently. He says, put off your old self. It belongs to the former manner of life. And it's corrupt through deceitful desires. So be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The old patterns, the old ways of living, they're corrupt. And we're told to put them off like the shedding of an old wardrobe that no longer fits. The old clothes don't fit anymore. We put on Christ and we are renewed. The form of that verb to be renewed, it's unique here in this passage. And the understanding is really a sense that we would say, you could read it as let yourself be renewed. Here's the point. This is not a self-made mind cleanse. 
we understand that our new mind, our new self is the work of Christ. And we know this because we are no longer darkened in our understanding. Friends, in a fallen world, sin is going to look normal. But our eyes have changed. What we used to not see, now we see. And so we are called out of a life of darkness and called to live differently. This call was true for the Ephesians nearly 2,000 years ago. And it is true for all of us living in this new COVID-19 reality. It was true for Christians in Ephesus, and it's true for us today. So have you found yourself returning to some old habits? I started with a question, and I want to return there again. What have you been doing with your COVID time? I can remember just a couple weeks ago when people were like, what do I do with all of this time? There's nothing on TV. I remember some of my friends who are sports fans, we were saying, what do I watch when there are no sports? I literally have nothing to watch. So ESPN started showing replays of old games and On the bright side, a new generation of kids were getting introduced to the greatness of Michael Jordan. But in the search for what to watch, places like uh, Disney Plus and Netflix, they, they saw that there was this demand and they're scrambling to get more content online faster. People were consuming it. And so they began to release some movies actually ahead of schedule to fill this demand Because there was a lack of new things to watch. Maybe your family movie night followed a cue from ESPN. And maybe instead of looking for something new, you went all nostalgic. Have you ever done that? Sat down with your kids and decided to watch a movie that you used to watch as a kid? If you haven't, let me tell you how it goes. Because I have. Here's the setup. You feel like... This is going to be some special moment where you share your childhood memories with your kids only to realize the movie is way not as clean as you remember. Suddenly you're like, oh no, I don't remember that being in there before. Have you ever had that experience? This doesn't just have to be with your kids. Scott and I were talking and sharing stories just this week of how we've both done this in youth ministry. And another pastor, we were all talking, and he told this story about how he was watching this show on television, and then his wife walks into the room, and he said, "Uh, I guess this kind of feels dumb when you're in the room. What changed in those moments? The movie didn't change. The TV show didn't change. But your perspective sure did. When you suddenly see with new eyes, you, you haven't seen it that way before, and you've been awakened to something different. Have you ever had an experience like this? Maybe it wasn't a movie. Maybe it was just a restaurant that you used to love. You know, before your palate got all fancy and refined. Maybe you went back and you realized the food is just not good. Here's what I want you to do. Take 60 seconds, and I want you to share a story with the people that are in the room with you right now of a time where you went back to some old thing, old activity, old movie, old restaurant, or maybe even an old habit, and it wasn't good. Share that with the people who are around you and the perspective that changed. I'm going to give you 60 seconds. Let's do that.
Well, I want to close with a story. I almost made it through the whole message without telling you about lizards. If you were clever and looked ahead, maybe you prepared, you read the title to this message, and you you saw it, you thought, what is this about lizards and stallions? I saved it for last because it's so good. So you probably thought, that's got to be the coolest sermon title of all time. And if you thought that, you were right. However, I need to admit, I didn't come up with that myself. It came from somebody who's a much better storyteller than I am. Now, I love to tell stories, but this one is masterful because it takes something that's not always easy to see and it gives it a brand new light. In his book, The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis tells the story of a character who's tormented by a red lizard and it lives on his shoulder. And this is probably the most memorable part of the entire story In fact, when this book was adapted for a production on stage and it was performed in New York City, this very scene received the most responses on survey cards because of the impact it had on the audience. The lizard, it represents the indwelling sin that we all face. And it constantly mocks the young man. And then an angel comes and offers to remove the lizard. The young man is initially thrilled, and he thinks, I can be rid of this thing which torments me. But then the young man recognizes that the angel is glowing with a deadly heat. And the way that the lizard is going to be removed is by killing it. The young man suggests, maybe that's not really necessary. I don't know that the lizard needs to die. And perhaps there's another time that's better for dealing with him. The angel will not be put off. This moment contains all moments, he says. And then the lizard, recognizing the danger he's in, begins to try desperately to convince the man otherwise. I want to play just a, a short clip from the audiobook because let's be honest hearing a guy with a really cool accent tell the story is way better than Tennessee Tommy reading so let's listen to this I cannot kill it against your will it is impossible have I your permission the angel's hands were almost closed on the lizard but not quite then the lizard began chattering to the ghost so loud that even I could hear what it was saying be careful it said. He can do what he says. He can kill me. One fatal word from you, and he will. Then you'll be without me, forever and ever. It's not natural. How could you live? You'd be only a sort of ghost, not a real man as you are now. He doesn't understand. He's only a cold, bloodless, abstract thing. It may be natural for him, but it isn't for us. Yes, yes. I know there are no real pleasures now, only dreams. But aren't they better than nothing? And I'll be so good. I admit I've sometimes gone too far in the past, but I promise I won't do it again. It may be natural for him, but it isn't for us. Yes, yes, I know there are no real pleasures now, only dreams, but aren't they better than nothing? And I'll be so good. I admit I've sometimes gone too far in the past, but I promise I won't do it again. I'll give you nothing but really nice dreams, all sweet and fresh and almost innocent. You might say quite innocent. Innocent. These are alluring words to those of us who know the lizard life. Because these are words that jog through our minds as we let our sinful pattern return. No one has to know. It won't hurt anyone. We could just ask for forgiveness. A a little won't hurt. Well, in the story, the angel does indeed attack the lizard. And as truth aflame, he seizes the lizard And with fiery hands and with a great power chokes the life from it. And the lizard falls to the ground, but surprisingly does not die. It changes. The ugly red lizard becomes a beautiful stallion. 
the beast that has ridden on the shoulder of the young man, mocking him, is now mounted and ridden. He who was the master is now mastered. He who was in bondage is now free. What was once ugly is now beautiful. Even though it's the same creature, it's transformed. Knowing the freedom and the beauty of this horse is the life that Paul has described for us in our passage. What would life look like if we lived it as if he intended us to live? We need to know that life that God intends for us is beyond our imagination. It is soaring, greater than we could ever even comprehend. God's plan for us is a life that is not blinded by the normalcy of living. We need to know that we could be set free from the bondage of sin and we can live a life that God has created for us no longer living without hope, no longer a slave to sin. This old self is something that we put off, and a new self is what we read about in this text today. Our old self has been dealt a death blow, and we are to starve this old life, putting it off and living a new life that is fed by the Spirit within us. Here's what I want you to do as we close. I want you to go and I want you in your home to find something that is red. Find something that you can hold. I'm going to give you 15 seconds. Go grab something. Go go on. I'm going to wait right here. Okay, got it? Now hold it in your hand for a moment. Consider what lizard sits on your shoulder. Consider the influence that these old ways are having in your life right now. And I want you to pray with me that God would take this lizard and destroy it. By the power of the resurrected Jesus. This lizard life is not for us. We were made for something far better. A stallion life. This is the picture of new life. No longer tormented by the chattering taunts of the deadness of sin. But soaring freely. Full of hope and life. Have you found yourself returning to old habits? Because they feel normal? Are you putting on old clothes because they're comfortable? God is telling us that the old clothes don't fit anymore. Would you put them off today and be renewed by the work of Jesus in your heart? Pray with me. God, we know that even as we hold this in our hands... That it is not who we are. That we hold this item that is red and so often taunts us. And it reminds us of the old habits that we go to far too easily. God, would you free us from patterns of sin? And that is, we would even hold this item that is red, we would be reminded, even by its color, that it was the crimson, red blood of Jesus that dealt the death blow to our sin. And that we have hope of new life because of the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus. God, would you give us once again right now this new life that we may soar and that we may live in the new life that points to a glorious hope in your son Jesus amen
my favorite line of Tommy's sermon was um, talking about how we are not made for this lizard life. That was pretty good. I like that image. Thank you, Tommy, very much. Friends, we are going to take communion together. Hopefully you have some bread and some juice handy, and so you can go ahead and get that ready if you don't already have it. So let's, let's take communion together right now, not simply to perform the act, but let us remember that it symbolizes two main things. One, the body and the blood of Christ that was given on the cross to pay for the annihilation of that lizard, to pay for our sin and to wipe it away. And number two, the second thing is that it, it is a sign, it is a reminder of our unity as believers. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17 says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. So let's take communion together, uh, even though we are not together uh, with each other, but thinking forward to the time when we will be in community together, when we can take this together. Friends, the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ poured out for you. Join me as we pray together. Jesus, we are thankful for what you have done so that we can have new life, so that we can be rid of this burden of sin, so that it no longer has to master us, but we can in turn become its master. Thank you for the opportunity of new life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, we would love to know who has joined us, who's worshiping with us on the other side of this screen. And so let me encourage you to connect with us with our Connect card. You can find the Connect card by going to fccgreen.org slash cc. And you can tell us about yourself. You can tell us who's worshiping with you. You can share prayer requests. You can uh, ask questions and sign up for um, different emails and different communications. If you are like me, then you are craving connection with people. I can't wait until coffee shops are open. I can't wait until I can get a group of buddies together and we can go rock climbing. I can't wait until we can have a group of people at our house and do some grilling together. I'm really uh, looking forward to that time with people. And so if you are looking for connection, if you are looking for more connection like this, then let me tell you about life groups. Life groups right now, of course, are meeting online over Zoom, but normally life groups get together every week. They do life together. They go hiking together. They grill together. They study the Bible together. And so if you are ready to, to engage like that and to grow with a group of people like that, then let me encourage you to grab your phones to get a little bit more information. Just text life group to 97,000, 97 and then three zeros and then somebody will get back to you and tell you a little bit more about life groups. At FCC, we pursue generosity. It's just, it's just a fact. It's one of the seven habits that define us. And so we pursue generosity towards others because God initially pursues us with generosity. Even the breath in our lungs is a gracious gift from God. So join us as we pursue generosity, giving us, uh, giving first, saving second, and learning to live off of the rest. You can pursue generosity with us, with our mission of helping people find and follow Jesus by going to fccgreen.org slash give, or you can click the link in the live chat below. We're going to end today with our uh, memory verse, and so we're going to say the reference and the verse. Are you ready? Ephesians 4, 15 through 16. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up 
in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Friends, thanks for being here with us. We miss you. We can't wait to see you. And we'll see you next week. Keep my heart from breaking And when it does you weep with me You're so close that I can feel you When I've lost the words to pray 
And though my eyes have never seen you, I've seen enough to say. I know that you are good. I know that you are kind. I know that you are so much more than what I leave behind. I know that I am. I know that I am safe Cause even in the fire To live is Christ To die is gain I know that you are good I don't understand the sorrow But you're calm within the storm Sometimes this weight is overwhelming, but I don't carry it alone. You're still close when I can't feel you. I don't have to be afraid. And though my eyes have never seen you, I've seen enough to say. I know that you are good. Yeah.